So proteostasis or protein homeostasis is all of the molecular events that are there to balance the cellular proteome or all the proteins within a cell. And since when we really talk about molecular fidelity, we're mostly referring to proteins when we're talking about aging, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how protein homeostasis actually helps to maintain molecular fidelity of proteins at all of these different levels. So the level of biogenesis, maintenance, and degradation for the next part of this, for the um, remainder of this lecture. And so you can imagine that doing all of these different functions, supporting protein synthesis, sorting, trafficking, folding, uh, as well as protein maintenance and protein degradation requires a lot of energy. And so proteostasis is also maintained by proteins. Um, whose molecular fidelity, therefore, also needs to be maintained. Which poses a pretty big problem, right? Because over time, this huge requirement for energy, as well as the fact that proteostasis is maintained by other proteins, means that it's going to ultimately likely fail, right? Because there's not going to be enough energy to support it, and the proteins that are there doing proteostasis and maintaining you know, the integrity of these other molecules will lose their integrity as well. And so usually proteostasis fails after reproduction. And I can show you a graph here that shows some of the um, processes associated with proteostasis um, in C. elegans and actually when they tend to fail, right? So you can see in development, heat shock response as well as the um, UPR, the unfolded protein response, um, are actually quite as well as protein synthesis or making of proteins is quite high. And all of these things help to um, both synthesize and maintain proteins, right? And then as you move into young adulthood and then ultimately into reproductive adulthood, or this purple area that says generation of progeny, and the animals begin to reproduce, there's a decline in the amount of protein synthesis as well as in the heat shock response and the UPR, which are some stress responses involved in the maintenance of proteins, right, and maintaining that molecular fidelity. And they decrease right at the beginning of reproductive adulthood. And as a result, what you can see is that there's actually an increase in the amount of degradation of proteins that ultimately will decline um, as the animals age. And there's also an increase in protein aggregation. And so rather than these proteins being able to be maintained and remain functional, they tend to lose their molecular fidelity and their structure. And when that happens, they can actually aggregate together to form toxic substances to the cell. Um, and that happens in the middle of reproductive adulthood as well. And so proteostasis, because it needs so much energy input, tends to decline during aging. And so, there are ways um, you can actually help um, improve or maintain proteostasis for longer and therefore um, also extend longevity and improve aging. And you can do that at different parts of proteostasis, right? And so first we're gonna talk about how you can do it at the level of protein biogenesis or at the level of kind of making the proteins, right? And so you can improve both aging and longevity by first decreasing the rate of translation and so you can imagine that if you decrease the rate of translation, you're making less proteins, therefore there's less proteins to maintain in the long run. And so by attenuating translation a little bit, you can actually extend longevity and lifespan. And another way that you can improve protein biogenesis and therefore extend lifespan and improve aging is by increasing expression of molecules known as molecular chaperones. And molecular chaperones have a couple of different roles in protein biogenesis. And what you can see here is a thing called an energy landscape. And when proteins are made or synthesized, they're typically unfolded. And they have to go through a series of folding intermediates in order to be folded into a functional protein that can actually do its job, right? And so you'll notice that it's sort of a high energy state to be unfolded and a very low energy state to be folded into a functional protein. 
and that each one of these folding intermediates will ultimately lead to the formation of a functional protein. And what chaperones can do is they can actually help folding intermediates along the way, right? And they can um, either stabilize a folding intermediate so that it has more time to continue folding into the functional protein. They can also correct kind of misfolds in folding intermediates and get them back on pathway to make a functional protein. And importantly, chaperones can prevent or inhibit the formation of aggregates or amyloid fibrils, both of which have a similar energy profile, or in some cases, even more favorable of an energy profile than the functional proteins. So it's pretty easy for a protein, at least in terms of its energy, to become an aggregate. And an aggregate is non-functional and can actually end up being toxic to the cell. So you don't want your proteins to form aggregates. And chaperones are there to kind of stop that from happening and keep the eye on the prize for the folding intermediates so that the proteins can become functional. And you can imagine that by increasing the amount of chaperones available, you increase the amount of functional protein available as well, right? Because you um, can help proteins fold along the way and you can also prevent misfolding. And so there's a lot of evidence that um, upregulating or increasing the expression of molecular chaperones can actually increase longevity and um, help with some of the phenotypes associated with aging. Right, and so one of these proteins that we talked about in lab, actually, um, are the small heat shock proteins. And they're sort of involved in the maintenance step as well, or maintenance of molecular fidelity. And what small heat shock proteins do is they basically bind with unfolded proteins and form sort of a complex sequestering them away from other unfolded proteins so that they can't form an aggregate, but kind of waiting for conditions to become favorable so that they can ultimately fold back into the normal protein. And so this sometimes unfolding or misfolding can happen during stress, right? And so during aging, there might be stressful event that causes your proteins to become unfolded. And what small heat shock proteins do is kind of stop those unfolded proteins from going the next step and becoming full-blown aggregates. And it gives them a chance to kind of hang out, complex together with the small heat shock proteins until there's a way for them to be folded back into their native structure or degraded so that they can't cause problems. And there are two main families of the small heat shock proteins, HSP12s and HSP16s. Um, and HSP16s we have talked a little bit about in lab. This is our micro. You can also affect the stress response pathways um, in order to help maintain proteostasis during aging. And so by modifying the stress response pathways that are there to maintain molecular fidelity of proteins, such as the heat shock response, which protects proteins from thermal stress, and the unfolded protein response, um, which protects proteins from other stressors, you can actually extend longevity. And what's interesting is that the stress response also really just means an increase of expression of chaperones. And I'll show you a little bit about what that means here, right? And so if we look particularly at um, any of the stress responses, right, a functional protein can be exposed to stress, whether it's heat stress or oxidative stress or even um, mechanical stress and become destabilized. And in order to counteract that destabilization, these stress responses upregulate different chaperones. So different heat shock proteins, small heat shock proteins, other heat shock proteins over here to prevent aggregation of proteins and get them back to functional form or to degrade them. And so ultimately by increasing chaperones, we can improve the stress response um, and help maintain proteostasis during aging. So it seems like chaperones have a role um, both in promoting kind of the biogenesis side as well as the maintenance side of proteins and keeping their molecular fidelity intact, um, both at the level of like making them and the level of maintaining them um, once they're made. And then um, the final kind of component of proteostasis and the balance of proteins is 
to actually degrade proteins that you don't need, right? And so um, protein degradation machinery has been shown to decrease in function as um, organisms age, including the system called the ubiquitin proteasome system. And so what the ubiquitin proteasome system does is basically um, ubiquitin molecules are added to a protein that is going to be degraded, and then those ubiquitins target that protein to this particular barrel-shaped structure called the proteasome, which is sort of like a trash can. And those proteins are then unfolded and threaded into the proteasome where they can be degraded into pieces. And those pieces can be reused to make other po um, polypeptides. So this works um, as a way to degrade proteins that are either um, maybe misfolded or maybe just old and non-functional um, or not needed by the cell. And by improving the ubiquitin proteasome system's function and upregulating its function as animals age, um, it has been shown to extend longevity and improve some of the, the declines associated with aging as well. And so not only does it help to kind of improve protein synthesis and maintain proteins, but it also seems to help in terms of aging and longevity to make sure you can still get rid of the messed up ones or degrade them. And so ultimately what I'd like to pose as a question is if improving proteostasis is the answer to aging, right? And so we already said that all of these processes of proteostasis, whether it's protein synthesis, protein folding, protein trafficking, um, and sorting, de degradation of proteins, um, all of these things use energy. And all of these things are unfortunately also promoted by other proteins whose molecular fidelity needs to be maintained over time as well, meaning that proteostasis will eventually fail. And that can likely contribute to some of the things that we see um, in cells and organisms that are associated with aging. And it's been fully confirmed that long-lived organisms, um, including one particularly long-lived rodent called the naked mole rat, have increased levels of proteostasis. And this is seen in not only naked mole rats, but other genetic model organisms like C. elegans, uh, Drosophila, mice, and even in humans. That um, organisms that tend to live long have a very um, increased level of either molecular chaperone expression um, highly functional ubiquitin proteasome system. They basically just have really good protein homeostasis. And so it's possible that just by figuring out different ways we can improve proteostasis, <coughs> we might be able to figure out ways that we can extend longevity um, as well as fight some of the age-associated declines that um, we see either in humans and other organisms. And so it's possible that improving proteostasis might not be the answer to aging, but it might be able to ameliorate some of aging's negative effects.